Dr. James Allison is the director of the Ludwig Center for Cancer Immunotherapy at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. His talk is Immune Checkpoint Blockade in Cancer Therapy, New Insights and Opportunities. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. You developed one of the first mouse antibodies to CTLA-4, which ultimately is the first immunotherapy to show survival benefit in patients with melanoma. Responses have also been observed in advanced renal, lung, prostate, and ovarian cancer. Could you describe some of the basic science that has driven the translational research resulting in the current immunotherapy-driven clinical trials? Yes, well, in the early 1990s, uh, people had, were becoming uh, frustrated from the idea of actually trying to mobilize the immune system to attack cancer. There had been a lot of efforts to study basic science, to really study um, and demonstrate that there are in human tumors T cells that can recognize tumors and tumor cells and potentially kill them in a very specific manner. And yet, after 10 to 15 years of, of fairly intense clinical activity, there's really not been much success in, in actually realizing this, this, this goal of generating T cells which could wander about the body and destroy tumor cells when, whenever they encountered them, wherever they were. Um, and, and provide immunological memory that would give you lifelong protection. I mean, it just, it just hadn't worked very well. And so um, I'm really trained as a basic scientist, and one of the things that occurred to me at the time, because I worked on regulation of T cell activation, is that we really did not know enough about how T cell responses are regulated. The idea at the time was that it was just a simple flipping of a switch you know, the antigen receptor recognizes something foreign or cancer, you know, go, span, kill. Um, but it was known by the late 80s that that wasn't true. There were additional signals that were needed um, that were called co-stimulatory signals. And we uh, identified a molecule called CD28 as being a, a molecule that was sufficient and necessary to provide a second signal with the antigen receptor to really get a T cell turned on. And we show that tumors don't express that molecule, so that's one reason that they're invisible to the immune system when they first arise. And the only way you can really get the immune system started is for some tumor cells to die, yield antigen, be picked up by phagocytic antigen-presenting cells, and then provide the signal in the context of CD28. But when we cloned CD28 and showed that, there was another molecule called CTLA-4 out there already that was... Uh, very homologous, all it was was a CDNA at the time, and nobody knew what it did. But very quickly, several groups showed that it bound to the same ligands as, as CD28, and it was proposed that it was another co-stimulator. But we produced a monoclonal antibody to the mouse form of this, and through a series of in vitro studies and, and uh, in, in vivo studies of mice, uh, produced a series of, of, of data convincing us that it was actually an inhibitory molecule and that uh, sort of served as the brakes. So to make an analogy, the antigen receptor on a T cell is the ignition switch that fits something very specific. Mm -hmm. But that signal without the CD28 signal, which is more like the gas pedal, is not sufficient to get it going. But once you push the gas, then you need to have brakes come up so that C34, that it, that gene is turned on and accumulates and eventually shuts down an immune response. And uh, this was controversial for a few years, but uh, as soon as we thought about that and then put it in the context of the failure of, of vaccines and failure of other strategies to mobilize the T cells to, to treat cancer, I thought, well, this will this should work. I mean, it, you, you should just by something as simple as making an antibody to CTLA-4 and blocking it, you could basically take the brakes off in the T cells, and hopefully they would just, you know, run at full speed and kill tumor cells. And this was compelling for a couple of reasons. One was, since you're treating the immune system and not the tumor, all vaccine approaches more or less have been targeted toward getting T cells elicited to something that was specific to a particular kind of tumor. But what we were doing was finding a way to just unleash T cells generally. And since we were doing that, and just we weren't paying any attention to the tumor at all. It had the potential to be a universal immunotherapeutic drug against all kinds of cancer as long as they had antigens. And the second thing was, because of the way it works, um, and it enhances priming of T cell responses when you kill T tumor cells, it could be used as a monotherapy to take advantage of, of the cell death that occurs occasionally when tumors get too big and cut off their food supply or whatever. But it also had the, showed the promise 
or at least in the early days, just we had the idea of this, that you could add it to radiation, or you could add it to chemotherapy, or you could add it to hormone therapy, or you could add it to surgical reduction or whatever kills T cells. You could enhance the effects of those and potentially get memory. The idea being that with all of those approaches, unless you get the last tumor cell, you're not going to cure cancer. But if you can get T cells behind those therapies by taking the brakes off and letting the T cells expand, you've got the potential of getting memory to the tumor antigens that were released during your treatment and getting some uh, hopefully cures of cancer. And so we began to do mouse experiments, which were just startling. I mean, the very first experiment we did transplantable tumor of mouse, mice, um, the tumors that weren't treated grew, and in a month we had to euthanize all the mice that were treated with a controlled antibody. Um, but if we treated with anacetylate 4, the tumors grew for a little bit and then got rejected, and all of them were cured. And they were, they were then uh, resistant to subsequent challenge from the tumors. And so at this point, we knew we really had something. The first experiments were done with the colon carcinoma model, but we quickly extended it to renal carcinoma, mammary models, in, 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 anyway, a broad spectrum of different tissue types in, in mice. And it either by itself or in combination with some other drug, we found we could cure virtually any kind of cancer in any mouse strain. And so this generated quite a bit of uh, excitement in the field. And so uh, it took a while, though, because of biases in the in the, in the biopharmaceutical world at the time where everybody was looking at small molecules. but mm-hmm. And plus the idea when we took it to some big pharma and said, well, we're going to cure cancer by taking something that blocks a negative signal and therefore lets this, you know, people are you're, you're nuts, you know. But but um, after accumulated five years or more of, of mouse work, finally um, a company called Metarex decided to go into it. And Metarex made uh, the first fully human antibody to C4 called Ipilimumab. We did a phase one trial with 14 patients, and there were three objective responses after a single dose. And with no retreatment, uh, these patients lasted for a long time. In fact, I met one woman um, who was in that trial, which was 10 years ago, and she uh, has been fine with no retreatment since then. Anyway, then this led to a, a lot of small trials and other kinds of cancer, um, initially just to, to see what kinds of cancer it worked with. And as you mentioned earlier, that it showed efficacy in the sense of objective responses in, in renal cancer, prostate cancer, lung cancer, ovarian cancer. So almost everywhere they looked, um, the Metarex looked. And then, anyway, then, then um, as you mentioned, um, that it was decided to focus on melanoma for a variety of reasons. And so Metarex and Bristol Myers Squibb put together a phase three randomized placebo controlled trial of monotherapy with this anti C34 antibody, ipilimumab, in late stage melanoma. And there was a survival advantage. As you mentioned, it was the first drug ever of any kind to show survival advantage in late stage melanoma. And there are two aspects of it that were interesting. One is the typical sort of thing that you see in the, in the papers where the, the survival curve of the control goes like this, and then you shift the other one over about five months or so. And so that was commented on. But the startling thing about the results with epilumumab is that at about two years, the survival curve flattened at about 23%, and it was there at two and a half years, three years, three and a half years, four years, four and a half years whereas the control arm then was essentially non-existent. Mm-hmm. And so it looks at, you know, between one in four and one in five patients have long-term survival. And given the survival of the patients from the phase one, which was done almost 10 years earlier, there's no reason to believe that those won't be five, 10, 15 years. We don't know yet. We're in the middle of it. But these are, are people who, I don't want to use the word cure, because in some cases there are small tumors remaining they seem to be in some equilibrium with the immune system, but it's been quite quite effective, and so that's generated quite a bit of quite a bit of excitement. So it was approved by the FDA last year, actually this year in March, for both front first line, a uh, second line, which is where it had been used before, that is in patients that have been heavily pretreated and failed, but now also in front line therapy of late stage melanoma. 
Would you discuss the potential in general for immunotherapies and also what are some of the challenges? I think the, what we've learned from this is, the, is, the, is that, first of all, immunotherapies can work. You can achieve long-term survival, uh, but under a fraction of patients. And so the challenge is to figure out how to move that 25% up. And so there are a variety of ways of doing that that we're exploring now. One is to combine it. We, we, this, this, this whole field now, I mean, we started it with c 4 because it was the first known cell intrinsic down regulatory molecule, if you will, in T cells. Before that, the notion was that T cells divide and then they die, and they're down regulated by dying. And, and we were the first to show that no, there's a cell intrinsic mechanism that just says stop dividing, you know, that attenuates the responses. Now it's known that there are at least four other molecules that do that. And uh, one of them is called PD1, it's got a ligand called PDL1. Uh, we've shown in, in mouse models that it, they work completely differently. They have the same net effect, they inhibit T cell responses, but they work differently. And so we've shown that if you combine those, uh, you can get much more uh, potent antitumor effects. So the, the, the area now has become known as just the general area is immune checkpoint blockade that these molecules that can, can stop immune responses, if we can block them, then we can unleash the response. There are also now some new opportunities that, that we've come across of molecules that actually, that are induced when you block c 4 there's some activation markers that come up that if you can give an agonist signal to them, you know, it would stimulate them, they make T cells work much better. And so if you combine removing the negative signal and giving a good positive signal, we've shown you can get incredibly powerful immune responses in, in mice, is where we are in mice. But uh, I think that where the real excitement is going to go is a combination of immunotherapies. Um, I mean, I think vaccines now, we, we need to go back and look at vaccines again because I do think it was uh, CTLA-4 and other of these molecules that were prevented effective, effective responses to vaccines. But if I could be a little controversial here, the, the new area that everybody is excited about now are genetic, genetically targeted therapy. So the idea is you sequence the genome of the tumor and you identify the driver mutation in uh, activating an age, you know, epidermal growth factor receptor or something, um, or a mutation in, the, in BRAF and melanoma. And, and so the idea is then you find a drug that will, will block that activity and uh, you can cure cancer. Well, the fact is you could get amazing responses with drugs like this. But an inherent process in tumors is genomic instability. And so inevitably, when you're hitting one thing like that, the tumor wins. Because either you mutate the target of the drug that you gave or you activate something downstream of it. But what people haven't thought about too much is that genomic instability, while it's the bane of these targeted therapies, is a gold mine for the immune system because many of the mutations that are generated represent new structures that are foreign in the body and the immune system can see them. And so what I've been proposing for the last few years is we look at these targeted therapies as vaccines. And so you use them to kill a lot of tumor cells, dump a lot of the mutated proteins from tumor cells into the body in a way that it activates the immune system and then come along and play tricks by sustaining the immune response um, to actually get that memory behind it. And so instead of just you know, shifting the survival curve to the right a little bit, which is all anybody's been able to do with targeted therapies. And then we've got this 25% tail with nic 4 If we combine it with the other, maybe we can get that tail up to 80% or something and really start curing cancer patients. So that's, we'll see. There are, there are clinical trials beginning that are based on, on that idea. That is so exciting. Um, what is it like, personally, to be on the forefront of immunotherapies? Well, uh, it, feels, it feels, I mean, good. If you're talking about the <coughs> personal reward, it feels pretty good. I mean, I, I, um, after I saw uh, the uh, results, our first results with nsc 24 it was a long story, but postdoc did the first one. I said, this is too much. I did the second experiment in a blinded way, and I saw this. I said, this is, you know, I've been around for a while, but I said, this is, this is, uh, this is work. This is going to work. 
and so it took a lot of a lot of uh, just sticking with it. It just it wasn't enough just to f have the idea and do the first experiments. What I learned over the years was you have to stick with it and be a voice for it and be an advocate for it and come along. And so there've been some missteps and some, but mostly good things. Interactions of, of a variety of excellent students and and postdocs and colleagues and interactions with people in companies. It really it's a large process and the fact that it's, been, it's taken 15 years to get to this point but it, but it feels pretty good and now I just you know, want to know where we're going next and how we can really make a realization of this to really help patients because I think we're really right on, right on the edge of something really, really big. Dr. Allison, thank you so much. <laughs>